Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network, or ECPN, a network of the American Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. My name is Jen Munch, and I am the webinar coordinator for ECPN's 2017 to 2019 term. Today's webinar is entitled Project Management, a Crucial Soft Skill for the 21st Century Emerging Conservation Professional. Before we start today's program, I'd like to quickly familiarize you with the GoToWebinar program. You can use the control panel to make modifications to your audio settings. All attendees are automatically muted by the program, but you can communicate with us and ask questions throughout the webinar using the question box. If you are watching this webinar with a group of people, please let us know how many using the question box. If you'd like, you can also hide the control panel with the orange arrow at the top of your screen. I'd like to take a moment to briefly share information about ECPN and our webinar series. ECPN is a network within AIC that is dedicated to supporting conservation professionals in the first stages of their career. Please visit our page on the newly redesigned AIC website, our Facebook page, or our Wiki of Resources for Emerging Conservators for more details about our activities. ECPN has an ongoing interview series with conservators and specializations that require particular training. On the AIC blog, you can find recent ECPN interviews with conservation professionals who specialize in the care of wooden objects, East Asian art, and electronic media. You can also find ECPN interviews with United States citizens who trained abroad and are currently practicing conservation in the US. Now a bit about our webinar series. ECPN organizes two webinars each year on topics relevant to emerging conservators. Our webinars are all recorded and the full videos are available on the AIC YouTube channel. If you have any ideas for future webinar topics, feel free to contact ECPN at the email you see on the screen or post suggestions on the, AC on the ECPN Facebook group. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today's webinar, Project Management, a Crucial Soft Skill for the 21st Century Emerging Conservation Professional. Quinn Ferris is the Senior Conservators for Special Collections at the University of Illinois Library at Urbana-Champaign and a, an adjunct professor at the U of I's School of Information Science. Today, Quinn will give an overview of project management and its application in conservation, and she will discuss her approach to project management within a university library setting. Nicolette B. Meister is the curator of collections of the Logan Museum of Anthropology at Beloit College and an instructor in Beloit College's Museum Studies program and she also serves as faculty director for the Center for Collections Care. Nicolette will present her own experiences with project management within a university museum with a particular focus on grant funded project management. If you would like to see more extensive biographies for our speakers, please visit the blog post regarding the webinar on AIC's blog. So let's get started with Quinn Ferris, who will discuss what project management is and share some of her experiences with it. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank Jen for the introduction and ECPN for making uh, this possible today as well as all of you who are remotely watching. I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about where I come from and how I came to use project management as an emerging conservator myself and then share some useful information regarding project management as a framework for managing large workloads, uh, hopefully offer some tools and tricks and then turn it over to Nicolette which I think will really complement and contextualize some of the broader concepts. A little about me, I graduated from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Program in 2015 as part of the very first round of Mellon funded library and archives training. In graduate school, I really focused my time on making sure I gained the right hand binding and treatment skills to be a book conservator. Uh, and I worked on a few group-based projects, largely under the direction of a supervisor. As an intern and fellow at the University of Virginia, I had some exposure to administrative practices, but not much. So in other words, I had no formal project management training. Next slide, please. 
So when in February of 2016, I got lucky and was hired into a full-time position as the rare book conservator at the University of Illinois, before even finishing my first fellowship, I think it would be fair to say that I was facing the challenge of stepping into a generally authoritative role with significant responsibility and comparatively little experience. And to set the stage about that, let me tell you a bit about the University of Illinois Library. The U of I is a public land grant institution. It has one of the largest academic libraries in the United States behind Harvard and Yale. What you see pictured is the facade of our main library, but the library actually consists of 25 plus area libraries located centrally within the main library or in satellite locations, six of which are designated as special collections. The conservation unit, which is part of the preservation department, serves the library in a variety of ways, including but not limited to undertaking complex conservation treatment, circulating collections repair, teaching and training students at various levels, long-term preservation planning, like disaster planning and response. But additionally, and maybe most notably for this webinar, we also function in support of the exhibit planning and preparation for special collections libraries. Next slide, please. And to zero in on our special collections just for a moment, here are some Im images of the U of I's rare book and manuscript library, including their exhibit space on the upper left. In the bottom right corner, you see the head of the RBML, Lynn Thomas, posing with our newly acquired manuscript written by Sir Isaac Newton, circa 1690, just one of the many incredible collection items that are special. Collections work hard to share and promote via classes and exhibits. As one example, the RBML has three to four formal in-library exhibits a year, plus additional loans to on and off campus venues. And that's just one collection. And that is a significant exhibit schedule for an institution that has no formal exhibit program or centralized exhibit resources, such as a coordinator, prepared, or a centralized registrar. Conservation, therefore, is somewhat by default the main source of support for library materials that are going on display. I don't think this is necessarily unusual. However, just as a last point of comparison, though we have collections on par in size with Harvard or Yale, we do not have the staff or the resources. Being a state-funded institution in Illinois, uh, we are at the mercy of a, an ongoing budget crisis, which means that we have to be prudent with our resources. And additionally, as at, at the time that I had started, the number of personnel available to work in conservation and preparation for exhibits was two people, uh, comparative to maybe their six or eight full-time staff members. All this is to say that while the U of I is a large institution and has a significant collection in various research and exhibit spaces on campus, the university generally and the university library specifically operates like many other smaller institutions, uh, which is on a shoestring. Next slide, please. I'm spending so much time talking about the context at the U of I to try and paint a picture of where I found myself as a new conservator. When I started in early 2016, the breakdown of my job on paper looked like this. 50% of my time was meant to be working on the bench on significant conservation treatments of cheaply special collections materials from various special collections libraries that had been prioritized by the collection managers. Next. And the other 50% was meant to be split into various administrative duties, which you see listed on the slide. I should point out that these percentages are rough estimations and don't necessarily represent the entire scope of every single job duty included in my position, but they do cover the vast majority. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, next slide. And there you go. All right. Uh, however, I found pretty quickly in my new position that not only was I overwhelmed with trying to balance the multiple demands of the job, but also that the time that should have been allocated for exhibit support and the time that it was actually taking me were nowhere near the same. Exhibit timelines were so full and compressed that I was spending all of my dedicated treatment time and then some just working on exhibit related activities, which made it challenging to complete other types of treatment as well as my supervisory and administrative duties. So after a little while of working this way, I also noticed that I wasn't the only one who was overwhelmed. My conservation colleague at the time was unsurprisingly overwhelmed with the status quo, but also the curators and collection managers who were organizing the exhibits were challenged by chronic understaffing and demanding teaching and research schedules. So the result was that planning for exhibits often came down to the last minute, and this also 
meant that last minute requests were being passed on to conservation, which could only be fulfilled by suspending other activities in the lab or working crazy hours to meet deadlines or both. Next slide, please. So quickly, it became clear that the current approach between conservation and special collections uh, was not working. It was bad for us in that it left us feeling burned out and often underappreciated by our colleagues, and it was a generally unsustainable work practice. It was bad for our colleagues as well. Our exhibits are great opportunities for collaborative working, as well as the opportunity to sort of satisfy a curator's intellectual or artistic vision, but in this case, we were instead stressed out and, and our relationships were deeply fraught. And this made our working relationships and overall communication tense. Uh, and perhaps most significantly to me as a conservator, it was not good for our collection objects. Often we had to compromise the depth of treatment, opting for stabilization over full treatment in order to meet deadlines. It also meant that we ran out of time when considering exhibit design or mounting or display engineering, which you can see pictured. I will point out that all of those items on the board were facsimile, but all the same. <laughs> Um, so I started looking around for resources to help me manage my own workload, and I found that there is a lot in the business world related to project management. And while the particulars are not exactly applicable to the world of conservation, I found for myself that some of the broader concepts and a few of the specific tools are. I should say that I'm no expert, and a lot of the information included is based on what I found worked for me in my institution and might not, not necessarily be transferable. But my hope is that by attempting to define project management in a conservation context as a framework for planning, you can, if you find yourself in a situation where you have to step in and act as project manager, you will have some tools at your disposal. Also, last caveat, I'll be returning to the example of project management for exhibit conservation and preparation, since that is where I have a lot of experience. But I think these principles can be applied to any project scenario. Next slide, please. So before we talk about what project management is, we need to think about what is a project. Projects, generally speaking, are temporary and unique. The purpose of a project is to attain an objective and then terminate. And the project usually concludes when it's specified objectives have been achieved. You can see some conservation-related projects listed on the example on the slide. Next slide, please. Okay, okay. Uh, so just to, in order to clarify our thinking a little bit about what a project is, let's look at projects as compared to the other things that happen in businesses, uh, operations. Operations are generally ongoing and repetitive. Uh, they are important for sustaining the business and operations adopt new sets of objectives and the work continues. So a workflow is an excellent example of an operation. To undertake a workflow, it might start out as a project, but then it is adopted as something that sustains the business uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. You may have noticed that in the examples on the previous slides, there were a few things that were categorized as both projects and operations. Projects and operations have a lot in common. Obviously, they can be carried out by the same people, often in the same environment and under same or similar constraints. They can also share some uh, activities. For example, an item or collection treatment can be considered a project when thought of in its own terms. However, treatment activity generally could be in a broader sense thought of as a recurring operation in a conservation setting. Likewise, preservation activities related to disasters could be considered either a project or an operation, depending on what aspect you're working on. Uh, or it can start as one and transition into being the other, which we will talk a little more about later. The main distinction, however, is that a project is a non-permanent endeavor that is undertaken to create a singular product, service, or result. Next slide, please. So when thinking about project management and conservation, it is important to understand that it's something that is already part of our jobs. We do separately have to realize that project, a project manager can, in many cases, be its own separate position within, institution, within an institution, 
For example, if a library or museum is undertaking major expansion, development, or reorganization, they might contract with a consultant who is a project manager. But for our purposes, it is important to start with the awareness that we are all already project managers to one degree or another. And that means you in your state as emerging conservators. You're already managing your projects in your early careers by identifying treatment goals, communicating and documenting your process your progress, monitoring your activities and keeping track of your resources spent and finishing one treatment or one project and moving on to the next. These are all examples of work done by conservation professionals that figure into project management. Furthermore, those that we work with who request our services or whose services we request could be thought of as our clients, whether they're curators or collection managers, librarians, user populations, or in the case of pre-program and graduate students, instructors or, or advisors. Um, these are all people who work with us on our projects and could be considered clients. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is project management then? Loosely defined, project management is just the targeted application of knowledge, skills, and communication to project activities in order to meet a goal. Project management usually traditionally breaks the steps of a project down into five phases of its life cycle and then provides a framework with which to tackle the project at hand using these phases as an organizational principle. In the business world, project managers spend a lot of time talking about the project life cycle, which is full of these really pithy bylines that help you understand each step, like plan the work and work the plan. I don't want to get too much to the weeds on this, but I will say that understanding the life cycle phases and categorizing your tasks accordingly can help you construct a logical and progressive order of operations. To take a more relatable example, if you think about a conservation treatment you have done or plan on doing, it's pretty easy to understand why you wouldn't begin treatment, which would be considered executing the project, before creating a treatment proposal planning the project, or decide to return an item to its collection, which would be closing the project without completing documentation, which would be monitoring the project. This is an easy example because it's one that we as conservators have some experience with. If instead you're working on a large scale project with multiple participants and many moving parts, you can avoid mistakes and the feeling of being overwhelmed by thinking of your project in terms of its life cycle as a point of basic organization. Likewise, when discussing project management for business, project managers are very concerned with the constraints of a project. Risk, cost, and client satisfaction are general terms that are used a lot to describe different factors that projects are both subject to and shaped by. Though in conservation, our focus is somewhat different than in a business, we're still often finding ourselves needing to worry about our budgetary limitations, the desires or expectations of the curator or client, or uh, the risk to the object rather than a risk to an investment. Um, therefore, it's important to identify your project specific constraints and work accordingly. So with this in mind, let's move on to looking at some other broader aspects of project management. Next slide, please. So you may find yourself in the role of project manager for a couple of reasons. Maybe because you're planning and initiating a project in your capacity as conservator, uh, or it could be that you're involved in a project that needs management and regardless of who initiated it, you find yourself having to step in and offer up some organization and help. Conservators are good project managers because the nature of our work is dependent on being able to monitor and integrate multiple discrete and technical processes in service of one activity, usually treatment. We are also uh, often, we end up as the default project managers uh, for multiple reasons. Exhibits are a good example of this since in smaller institutions without a codified exhibit program, conservation timelines can be the longest or most complicated, which sometimes puts the onus on us to figure out how to manage competing deadlines. Disaster response is another example where this could happen. In a disaster, conservation and preservation officers have to act as experts to assist with proper protocol and work close re response and recovery. So we often become the default project managers when working with numerous others. Next slide, please. As official or unofficial project manager, it's important, it's an important first step in identifying, excuse me, an, import, an important first step in identifying uh, who you're going, is in identifying who you're going to need to work with. I'm so sorry. Um, the other project stakeholders. So a standard definition for a stakeholder is an independent party with an interest or concern 
uh, in something, usually a business or a project. In our case, a stakeholder can be considered anyone who's concerned about the outcome of the project or anyone involved in making the project come to a successful conclusion. You can see some examples listed, again, using the scenarios of exhibit planning and disaster response. Uh, in these examples, identifying anyone who has a duty, timeline, or agenda in the project and who will be responsible for and party to ongoing communications during the five stages of project life cycle should be included. This identification step is very important. Anyone participating in the project should be brought in from the beginning. If you skip this step, you risk later blind signing blind citing someone when you need their involvement. Next slide, please. Once you have your stakeholders, it's important to begin creating working relationships by opening communication. Some stakeholders you identify may be people whose paths you frequently cross, others you may rarely see or work with directly. In either case, if possible, it's incredibly helpful to have relationships established prior to working together on a big project. The process of developing communication relationships does a couple things. It builds understanding of respective professional responsibilities and limitations. It uh, Early attempts at communication can give cues on communication style, like whether they prefer email or in person and whether they're very responsive or not, so you can manage accordingly. And equally importantly, it starts to build trust and good faith, and that willingness to help you when the time comes goes a long way. Next slide, please. However, opening communication can sometimes be intimidating. It especially if you're a new professional and just settling into an institution, can feel difficult to reach out to those in upper management who are outside your department. Uh, but here are a few low impact ways to start build relationships. If you are starting at a new institution, particularly, you might find it helpful to start by scheduling brief meetings or tours. Uh, people really respond when you take an interest in the work that they have done or the ways they've managed or cared for their collections and they're so much more likely to respond for later requests to work together if they have a face to go with your name. Uh, something I picked up as an intern in fellow was this idea of open office hours and I have since adopted it. It's an ideal in a university setting but I think it can be adapted to other types of institution as well. Uh, I would take a day a week and work inside a collection space even if it was just answering emails or doing minor in situ work. Uh, I found that it gave people an opportunity to get used to seeing me and gradually they got more comfortable asking questions and reaching out. Obviously, if you work in a museum, it might be a little bit different, but you could try working in a common area like a cafeteria or break room or de departmental library and advertising your availability. At the heart of these suggestions is just good advice about communication in general and the idea that being visible to your coworkers and your institutional community implicitly builds awareness and trust, as well as exposes you to other professionals you might not be working with on the regular. Next slide, please. On the other hand, once your project is on deck, it's vital to create functional communication with your stakeholders that is project specific. Uh, here at the U of I, we really do this by having a kickoff meeting in which all of the stakeholders are present. This is an opportunity to hash out what your project is all about, its goals, the timeline, important milestones and deadlines, and any other critical information. Equally important is that you take the time with everyone in the room to agree upon a platform to communicate and a means to track your progress, as well as agree on how often to communicate in the future. Um, for some people in certain projects, the step might be better done via a conference call or over email or some other project management platform. It really doesn't matter so long as everyone is using the same platform and consistently updating shared documentation. Next slide, please. I mentioned uh, scope in the previous slide, and I think it bears a little individual investigation. Scope can be interpreted in a few different ways. For large-scale conservation-related projects, scope may mean a number of type of objects that might be relevant to be included in a project. For example, the intellectual scope of an exhibit as set by a curator's vision will determine what kind and how many objects might be included. And it's important for the conservator or conservation professional to understand how that might impact the entire collection. On the other hand, scope can also refer to the logistical limitations of what can be achieved. For example, if conserving a grant-funded digitization project, money or time may practically influence what can be achieved within the scope of the project. 
In either case, it's important to establish boundaries of what is and is not included in order to make sure your project remains feasible. Considering other factors that may influence how much can be achieved is important. For example, it might be appealing to have an exhibit that includes 50 collection items, but if you only have two cases, it's not feasible. Establishing scope in this case is also a useful way of setting boundaries and managing the expectations of your collaborators if things are getting out of hand in the form of scope creep. Next slide, please. Once your scope is established, it's important to start thinking about your timeline. And timelines are a critical part in that they enable you to assess whether your project is on track to be finished by its deadline. Uh, but in my opinion, figuring out your own personal timeline with others is impossible if you don't have a, sen a sense of how long individual processes take you. And so in order to do that, you have to time yourself. When working on treatments, you can practice estimating how long one treatment step takes you, time how long it actually takes, and then look at the difference. If you do this every time you work on a treatment and sum the time spent, you can get a sense of how long a particular type of treatment usually takes you. Now, take that time that you think it's going to take you and double it, because life happens and timelines shift shifts, personnel changes, and the unexpected occurs. Where other aspects of project management may be familiar or recur recurring, this is really the only aspect that is actually a constant. Try to plan ahead by overestimating the time you need. Then in best case scenario, you finish early, which will be welcome news for your collaborators. Worse, you'll finish exactly on time. Obviously, things would be a lot simpler if you only had one project to work on at a time, but that's really the case. Something I do often is just listing my ongoing projects in order of importance with relevant deadlines. And when something seems unmanageable, I try to break it down into chunks and make recurring appointments on my calendar to do something for an hour or two once a week. Most importantly, I want to emphasize that you really have to figure out what your personal release valves are. Especially as new conservators, it can be tempting to take a lot on to prove our skills or gain our experience. I don't want to discourage you from doing that, but it's vitally important to prioritize your health and well-being and to know your limitations. Uh, if you are being stretched too thin, take an inventory and find out what you can let go of, even if only temporarily. Delegate to peers, ask for help from your supervisors. Sometimes you just need to take a breath, but other times you need more than a breather, and it's important to know yourself and know what you need to do. Next slide, please. Uh, often, though, the challenge of managing timelines comes from competing timelines with others, so having good communication in this step is key in order to determine how to accommodate everyone's priorities. When in doubt about timelines, start at the end and work backwards. Some types of projects, like disaster response, may have open-ended dates that span years. An easy example is the 1966 Florence flood. Uh, it affected the collection of the Biblioteca Nazionale. Um, the, if you go there today, you can still see a backlog of those books that are being treated. After the flood occurred, obviously there was an initial wave of disaster response, which would have been considered sort of project in nature to try and stabilize and treat the affected materials. After a while, however, because of the backlog, that really translated over to a daily operation. So I bring up this example to say a timeline can still be established within a projected time frame, listing the sequence of events that need to happen to move a project along to the conclusion and also to help identify the end of a project phase and the beginning of an operation. I would encourage you that trusting your colleagues to have a similar sense of their own workflows is a good way to go. Uh, you can always do your best to try to work with them while also knowing your own personal boundaries. Additionally, it's important to understand the difference between an ideal timeline versus a realistic timeline versus an unreasonable timeline. That which is ideal to you may be unrealistic for your collaborators and vice versa. If you're regularly doing one type of recurring project like exhibit planning, again, as an example, it might not be a bad idea to develop policies around your expected timeline. Next slide, please. So throughout the, planning, the project planning process, it's incredibly important to document your experiences. First of all, it helps with learning as you go, since nobody knows everything from the start. Uh, keep track of what works and what doesn't. For what doesn't, brainstorm different approaches with your colleagues and try something new the next time. This can lead to the, the development of standard timelines, guidelines, and policies for future reference so planning and execution can improve with each project. There are many templates out there for project summaries and debriefing that you can find in Word or by doing a Google search of the term project summary. These are 
useful for providing brief snapshots and reflections of success and failure or to personally account for time and resources spent on a project. Um, additionally, I would really say this practice can be vitally important for making a case for more support. Sometimes, excuse me, your project will come to an end having been a difficult or unpleasant experience, and it might not have been for the lack of planning and good project management, but for the lack of resources. So tracking those problems as well as the successes can be useful when advocating for more money, equipment, personnel, or other needs. Um, uh, so at the U of I, I will say in the last year, we have gained two new exhibit related positions that came directly as a result of advocating for more personnel based on our documented experiences. So it can be done. Before I turn the show over to Nicolette, I do want to touch on a few helpful tools for project management. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one is the Gantt chart. Helpful, it's a helpful didactic for understanding overlapping activities and laying out important steps sequentially and in real time. Uh, I believe the one pictured is available via Google Docs and is listed in the resource slide. Gantt charts are good visuals for other stakeholders in the order of operations, what activities need to be happening in tandem to one another, as well as overall deadlines. And in general, I find that it helps if there's some kind of centralized documentation that everyone is sharing. We use Google Drive and Google Docs, but there are other platforms out there such as Box and Dropbox. Next slide, please. Another good tool on the subject of time management is Hours Tracker. It's a phone app. It tracks the time you spend on projects for independent contractors. It basically allows you to clock in and clock out and then tag the time spent, like mending or surface cleaning, so you can see how much time you have spent on one activity. If you don't have a smartphone, you can also go old school and just keep a notebook for treatments, write down your start, stop time and activities. I've also found in my organization that a shared calendar is incredibly helpful for setting meetings and looking back at past activity. It doesn't matter the platform that you use, Outlook, iCal, Google Calendar, so long as everyone who's involved in the project is on the same one. Next slide. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention project management platforms that are out there. There are many, including Basecamp, Trello, Confluence, etc. These are tools that are were largely designed for startups or software developers, people who are working remotely, but can be adopted for any shared project at any institution. Some of the pros include that they automate a lot of the planning and monitoring steps so you don't have to remember to send every email. Centralizes communication and it can easily sort and archive materials from from past projects. Uh, I know ECPN uses Basecamp for this purpose um, for future reference. And many of these platforms also offer limited free trials. So you can test them out before committing to using them. However, there are cons as well. Uh, they can be too expensive for some institutions to purchase and maintain, and they depend a lot on the technical savvy and willingness of stakeholders to buy in and use them. A personal caveat is that I have not found one that has a calendar function that operates better than our shared Outlook calendar. Um, uh, next slide, please. So to close, I just want to leave you with a few parting thoughts. Ultimately, to me, project management is really about figuring out how to strategically work with other people. If nothing else, a friendly disposition and a helpful attitude go a long way. But it's also important to remember to know yourself. Uh, important both as a new professional to learn what works best for you, your needs and limitations, but also as a person to understand when to say no and what your personal boundaries are. Um, collaboration can be equal parts inspiring and frustrating. At the low points, it's important to remember that everyone wants to achieve the same thing and to do the best they can. It's important to have compassion and awareness of your colleagues' processes. Hopefully by extending them the courtesy over time, they will be able to do the same for you. Next slide, please. Uh, so, to, uh, so finally, here is a list of resources you might find useful that were touched upon in my presentation. There are many more out there li than listed. So if this is what is your appetite for project management, I would encourage you to do some research on your own or to reach out anytime. And with that, let me turn it over to Nicolette. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Quinn. That was fantastic. And I want to thank uh, everyone out there attending today's webinar. So the perspective that I'll share today is based on my experience implementing seven IMLS and NEH collection focused grants over the course of the last 13 years at a small academic museum. My goal today is to make clear how preservation planning and project planning 
can serve as the foundation of successful project management. Like Quinn, I have no formal training in project management. My academic training is in anthropology and museum studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and University of Colorado at Boulder. And my focus has always been on the preventive care and management of anthropology collections in particular. My previous experience working at the Milwaukee Public Museum, Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England, Denver Art Museum, and the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History was all project-based work under the supervision of other people who developed and managed the projects that I helped to implement. I think this is pretty typical of how most of us get our feet wet with project management. We implement, but we don't necessarily conceive, develop, or assess project outcomes. Next slide, please. I want to begin by establishing the need for museum and conservation-based training in project management. But before I do so, I want to make clear the difference between hard and soft skills, since that's part of the title of today's presentation. Generally speaking, hard skills are functional skills. This is your expertise, which is often obtained through education and training. Soft skills, on the other hand, are general competencies or transferable skills, and they're often acquired through practice. These are frequently the type of skills that aren't taught in the classroom, but they, those that you're gonna gain through practical work experience. Of the top 10 skills sought by employers that you see here, you'll notice that it's a mix of both hard and soft skills. You can earn degrees in many of these areas, but others like organization or time management and teamwork, these are gained specifically through experience. In 2016, IMLS convened 47 museum studies professionals from 23 institutions across the nation for a one-day gathering to learn what each institution was doing to develop and train the next generation of museum professionals. One of the six key takeaways addressed project management. Specifically, project management was suggested as one of the relevant courses for all museum studies programs. I suspect the same would hold true for conservation programs. While professional development training and project management is available through the American Alliance of Museums, they offer a four-part webinar on project management, and also the American Association for State and Local History, they offer an online course called Project Management for History Professionals. Um, but there is a decided lack of professional ma management coursework in museum studies training programs. Johns Hopkins Museum Studies Program offers such a course but this seems to be the exception rather than the norm. Next slide, please. The Logan Museum of Anthropology is one of two museums on the campus of Beloit College, which is a small, we, we have approximately 1,100 students, undergraduate liberal arts college located in Southern Wisconsin. The Logan Museum, which is the yellow limestone building in the foreground, was founded in 1894 based on collections exhibited and acquired at Chicago's World's Fair in 1893. Since then, the museum's collections have grown to over 350,000 archeological and ethnographic objects that are worldwide in scope. Beloit College is also home to the Wright Museum of Art, which curates about 6,000 works of art. As you can see from our mission statement, the Logan Museum is first and foremost a teaching museum. All collections are considered teaching collections and are used to support the college curriculum. In addition, Beloit College is home to an undergraduate museum studies program, which began in the early 1980s. Despite the size of collections, our permanent staff is quite small. Uh, we'll soon be restructured from a core staff of three. We had a curator of collections, a curator of exhibits, and a director, to a core staff of 1.5. Myself and a director who will be shared with the Wright Museum. Next slide. Because we're small, my roles and responsibilities are diverse. I teach in the museum studies program, manage all aspects of collections care, acquisition and access, as well as manage students working in collections. I also perform administrative functions like grant writing and budget management and donor cultivation. And I assist in exhibit curation and installation and most recently launched a new professional development program called the Center for Collections Care. Wearing so many hats is exceedingly common in academic museums and in small museums in particular. Given that approximately 75% of the approximately 35,000 museums in the US are small, multitasking is the reality for most of us. Based on my experience working with conservation professionals and the perspectives that Quinn shared, I think it's safe to say that the same holds true in conservation. 
Due to our small staff and the fact that the college fundraising efforts are primarily focused on operations, the endowment or current strategic priorities, federal grants are the primary source of funding available to us to address our priorities. Next slide, please. Our strategic priorities are informed by our mission as well as conservation assessments that served as the basis for our preservation plan. I've been with the Logan Museum since 2000. This slide offers a long-term look at what we've accomplished over the course of the last 18 years. I share this flowchart because it makes clear that change happens incrementally, and also because it serves as a good example of a holistic snapshot of preservation planning. Preservation planning is really the key to successful project management. Preservation planning, as many of you already know, is the process by which general and specific needs for the care of collections and a prioritization of these needs are established. It usually begins with either a general or collection specific conservation assessment. The preservation plan then articulates the short and long-term goals and identifies the resources needed to accomplish them. All of the grant funded projects identified here are temporary and unique. As Quinn previously described, temporary projects have specific goals and outcomes and have specific start and end dates. Next slide, please. However, due to the constraints of time and money, most projects in small museums are operational. While many of us do it unconsciously, I think most of us operationalize our daily tasks and responsibilities. Thinking incrementally or in terms of this step-by-step -step methodology helps you to better coordinate tasks, stay organized while multitasking, plan ahead, which helps facilitate better time management, communicate in advance with all stakeholders, and identify and troubleshoot problems in advance. These are some of the daily operations that consume my work days. All of these projects are happening simultaneously and compete for my time and for limited lab space in the museum. It's especially important for me to operationalize projects that I hand off to students to implement. Clear step-by-step -step instructions empower students to work independently and helps me keep tabs on their projects that often span multiple weeks due to the fact that they work very limited schedules. Additionally, because students and faculty don't always plan ahead, above all, a willingness to be flexible and adaptable is essential. I frequently remind myself that it's my job to balance preservation and access to ensure that the museums and its collections are meeting the educational needs of our parent institutions. In museums and in conservation, like many nonprofits, we're not working for a living, we're really working for a cause. Next slide. As the flowchart I shared previously illustrated, all of our temporary projects flowed from our conservation assessment and preservation plan. These steps are critical if your institution aspires to apply for federal funds to implement collections care or to manage upgrades or to perform conservation surveys or treatments. It's also important you be able to demonstrate an institutional commitment to collections care. This is usually done by means of a strategic plan but funds and staff allocated specifically to collections care also demonstrates that an institution views collections equal in importance to exhibitions and education. These points might seem really rudimentary, but if you recall data from the Heritage Health Index, you might be reminded that 80% of institutions do not have paid staff dedicated to collections care, that 77% of institutions do not specifically allocate funds for preservation in their budgets, and 70% of institutions do not have a current assessment of the condition of their collections. Next slide, please. Quinn previously provided an overview of the project management life cycle or stages, which you see at the top of this slide. From my perspective, the main reasons projects fail are the same reasons why grant projects fail to federal agencies. They both have roots in the planning stage. Again, this is why preservation planning and project planning serve as the foundation of successful project management. In the next four slides, I'll provide a brief overview of the difference between goals and objectives, which will help you ensure a project is not poorly defined. I'll talk about the critical importance of a well-substantiated project methodology, which will avoid a poorly researched or defined project. I'll talk about how pilot projects and experienced personnel will make clear that project staff have the appropriate skills and experience to successfully implement the project. And finally, I'll briefly talk about how to avoid unrealistic timescales and budgets 
and address risk management and the planning process. Next slide. A poorly defined project is an indicator of a poorly planned project. From the perspective of somebody who's reviewed many federal grant proposals, it's immediately obvious to a reviewer if a project is poorly defined. The more clearly you can articulate your goals and objectives, the easier it will be for reviewers to understand exactly what you plan to accomplish. Projects are generally defined in terms of goals and objectives. However, they're frequently confused or not clearly articulated. Goals answer the big picture question of what you intend to accomplish. They're often broad statements and often not measurable. An example might be something like to increase the preservation of and access to the fill in the blank collection. Objectives, on the other hand, are often specific actions and they're frequently stated in terms of action verbs or active verbs. Objectives are measurable. So think outcome-based evaluation, which is the measurement of results. Make sure your objectives are reasonable and can actually be accomplished within the time frame of your project. Promise too much and your reviewers will question, will question whether you're a wise investment. Next slide. The backbone of any project is the methodology, sometimes referred to as the plan of work. The project objectives indicate what you'll do, but it's the methodology that makes clear how you will do it step-by-step step or phase-by-phase phase from start to finish. Project methodology is where theory meets practice. This is where you apply all the standards and best practices you learned in graduate school and make use of your growing conservation library of books and articles. If you don't have experience doing what you propose to do, be sure to consult with those who have to gain a better understanding of what worked and what didn't work. Use your growing professional network to identify individuals at other institutions who have completed similar projects. Consult with them and be sure to reference the consultation in your proposal. Even if you do have experience, consulting with others helps substantiate best practice through consensus. In addition, review successful proposals from the grant program to which you intend to apply. Study how they presented and organized their methodology. Even if the project is not similar, there's a lot to be gained from reading successful proposals. Grant agencies post examples online, or you can even ask a program officer. Their job is to cultivate successful proposals, so make the most of their support. <coughs> Next slide, please. Lack of appropriate skills and experience is another reason why proposals fail. Funding, funding agencies will want to see that the person directing the project has leadership experience, ideally that they've implemented another project of similar scale, and that the project staff have relevant skills and experience. Because implementing a new project often requires new skills and equipment or the application of new procedures or protocols, completing relevant training before the project begins is a great way to demonstrate that the project staff are actually qualified. Depending on the funding agency, training can actually be embedded in the project proposal. This is especially important if projects involve students or volunteers. I embedded training into most of the Logan Museum's grant proposals precisely because our primary workforce is undergraduate students. I brought in object and photo conservators who provided workshops on mount making, packing collections, photo preservation, silica gel storage for metals, and use of data loggers. It was a great way for our students to gain the hard skills needed to implement the project, and it was value added in the sense that they were able to network with practicing professionals and learn more about possible careers in conservation. Next slide. Oops, wait, nope, not next, back, sorry. And if possible, test your methodology on a small sample to identify what equipment or materials you may need, problems you may face, and how you will address them. Time task analyses are also important pilot exercises that'll help ensure your timeline is realistic. Earlier this month, there was an interesting discussion on the collection stewardship listserv about inventory methodologies and timeframes. Doing a trial run was the biggest takeaway, um, and this was given the, the variance in the state of different museum collections. Because we don't have a conservator on staff, we also use conservation consultants to help benchmark or evaluate performance. You may also want to add a consultant to your project if it's the first project for which you're serving as the project director. Next slide. 
And finally, unrealistic timescales and budgets, as well as poor risk identification and management, also prevent successful project management. Projects should be organized into manageable phases with measurable outcomes. The table on the right illustrates project award products from the NEH Humanities Collections Reference Resources grant-funded project we recently completed. These are, the, these are the deliverable products or outcomes. These products provide access to invaluable reference resources to the project's audience. Quinn mentioned different planning and tracking tools, but often funders will dictate the format of your work plan. So for example, IMLS asks for a schedule of completion that reflects each major activity identified in the proposal with projected start and end dates. The schedule of completion is what reviewers look to in order to determine if your proposed timescale is realistic. Keep in mind that reviewers are selected based on their knowledge, content expertise, and experience implementing similar projects. Write for an intelligent reviewer, but don't assume that they know your institution, your collections, or the particulars of your project. Reviewers will look to see if the expenses are reasonable representation of costs for your project. If your project is well planned, you should not have unexpected costs and there should be no reason to pad your budget. Granted, no matter how carefully a project is planned, something may still go wrong. I've had to adjust project personnel and budgets mid-project. Funders understand that changes may occur, but it's your responsibility as project manager to communicate these changes to all of your stakeholders. Being a good project manager means recognizing when there's a problem and taking action to correct course. Next slide, please. I've pulled together a number of resources that will help flesh out many of the points that Quinn and I covered. The first is a book authored by Martha Morris, who is Professor Emeritus of Museum Studies at the George Washington University. This is a recent book and it offers a wealth of information, including some really great templates for project planning. I also mentioned in my pre presentation both the AAM and AASLH professional development training opportunities. Neither of these are free, but the AASLH online course, um, participants are able to apply project management principles to a real life project. So these are all opportunities that are worth looking into in more detail. Next slide. On a final note, I'd like to echo Quinn's advice to document your experiences and outcomes. And I'd go a step further to encourage you to publish or present your methodologies or outcomes. The methods, materials, and processes of our work is constantly are constantly evolving and new strategies are always being developed. This is why it's so crucial for us to share what we've learned and to celebrate our success successes, and even our failures. Some funders will even ask for a dissemination plan. They want to know how you plan to share the results of your project. Project results may not be the same as sharing methodologies, but since many funders are concerned about building institutional capacity, sharing your project methodology through a conference presentation gives back to the profession on a larger scale. Once again, thank you for attending, and thanks also to the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network team for making this webinar possible. Hey, thank you very much, Nicolette, and thank you, Quinn, as well. It looks like we do have a few minutes for some questions from participants. So if you have any questions, please send them in using the question box. Um, and actually, I had a question for the two of you, and I wanted to start out um, with uh, actually, I have a few questions, but one I had in particular for Quinn was because you are a books conservator, Quinn. I was interested. Um, I would be interested to hear whether your training in books conservation has been beneficial in any way to project management. That's a great question. I think that uh, in in being a book conservator specifically does train you in sort of batch treatment in ways that I think maybe are. Um, are very natural in book conservation and not as usually found in other uh, disciplines of conservation. I would say being a library conservator specifically is what help, has helped me in project management less than being a books conservator specifically. I think you can, it, it comes a lot from the context that you're working in and as Nicolette mentioned, the many hats that you have to wear. And so I think the context has been everything for me in terms of, of even being motivated to learn more about project management. 
Great answer. Thank you very much. Nicola, did you have any thoughts on that topic? And uh, don't worry if you don't, I do have another question for you. I'll take the next question. <laughs> sure thing. So I have a question, um, and I think Nicola, you actually spoke about this just a, you spoke about this a little bit in your um, in your presentation. Um, actually, I have a question that either of you could answer if you wanted to. So I was once given the advice to say yes to everything, and I think both of you did touch on this a little bit, but sometimes you do need to say no. And I was wondering, how do you uh, balance your needs and your limitations with um, you know, the needs of your, your coworkers and people who do need something from you? That's an excellent question and one in which there is no easy answer for. Um, I think even in my nearly 20 years at the same institution, I still have a hard time saying no. Um, and I think the impression is that that's generally something that comes at the very beginning of your career but I think it's also important to continually challenge ourselves. And I tend to be a yes person for that reason. Um, but what I've learned over the years is that there are times um, when it's more appropriate to say yes than other times. So I have to take a long-term look at what is happening in any given semester. So for me, um, it's all based on the academic year. So if there aren't any major time consuming projects that I know will pull me in different directions, that's a time where I can say yes to things that I might not otherwise be able to. So I've really learned to try to balance that with a, um, a longer perspective on things. But I don't think that ever goes away, at least it hasn't for me, the need to say yes or the desire to say yes. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would echo everything Nicola said, but I would also say that I think, I, I don't know, I came up in conservation with a very uh, strong awareness of the fact that conservators have often been cast as the naysayers. And I think that um, we want to destroy that stereotype. And also I think, you know, museum professionals in general um, and collections care people were, were a a, f a field of overachievers. <laughs> so we, we feel obliged and desirous of saying yes. But I think that one thing that I do a lot is I will say no to a, a request as described and try to offer alternative pathways to achieving the same outcome. Sometimes people's expectations are just too unwieldy and you can, you are capable of doing some part of the request, but not all of it. So I think you know, creative thinking and problem solving, and then getting back to that good communication relationship is important. Great, right, thank you both for those answers. And we actually had um, some input from one of our attendees who agreed with both of you. Um, and this was Amanda Richards wrote in to say that she never says no, but let's the people know um, how their request will fit into their timeline. So saying, for example, yes, but I won't be able to get to it feasibly for six to eight months. And she also uses the same idea of doubling your time estimate as uh, Quinn mentioned. Um, so that's really terrific. Thank you for writing that in, Amanda. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question. So I have one that's specifically for Nicolette. Um, as you mentioned, there are many options out there for courses and certifications in project management. And even though they're not targeted specifically for conservation professionals or cultural heritage professionals, do you think they could still be useful for us? Absolutely. Um, I think so. Quinn, Quinn mentioned a variety of different sources, both online and different software packages that can help train you in project management methodology. But as she noted, those are really for the business sector. And what's interesting is that we're starting to see that creep into the not-for-profit sector. And so we're starting to see our um, professional organizations, and I'm, I'm speaking sort of from the museum world at least, um, with AAM and ASLH now offering um, courses online in project management. And while these may not be tailored specifically for conservation, my feeling about professional development is that if there's a nugget that I can get from that, um, and hopefully I don't have to pay 
um, you know, a nugget of gold worth of money um, for that piece of information, it's well worth doing. And so I think that those professional development opportunities that are geared toward museum professionals, in particular, the book that I mentioned by Martha Morris, are very, are, are great resources. Um, there was actually a, a webinar that I saw, or not a webinar, it was a in-person workshop at the British Museum, excuse me, at the British Library for conservation professionals. So I, we're starting to see more of these sort of things because we're realizing as a profession of conservators and museum professionals that this is a really important skill. And so more courses are being taught in programs, more courses are being taught by the professional organizations, and I would take advantage of them as many as you can. Great, thank you so much. That's a really good answer to that question. Um, we have some other good questions that just came in, but unfortunately we have just run out of time. Um, but if the speakers are willing, we will address those questions in a follow-up blog post. And in the blog post, we can also include links to all of the great resources that they've provided. Um, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions, uh, please email the address that you see on the screen here. And I just wanted to sincerely thank both of our speakers for participating in this webinar. Um, it was truly fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with all of us. And thank you as well to the rest of the ECPN officers and to AIC for helping us to promote this uh, webinar and to organize it as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thanks so much.